In a little bit, we're going to meet Rabbi Mark Wilds, the uh, founder of MJE. We're going to uh, jam a little bit with Avram Rosenblum, who founded the Diaspora Yeshiva Band. Um, still love to hear from you. Love all the comments and the notes that I'm getting. OU Live at OU.org. It's been a really fun week. Still open to comment suggestions and anything that I can show my wife to prove her that I'm actually doing something when I disappear for a half hour. Um, in the meantime, it is a distinct honor to introduce our next guest, Rabbi Jason Wiener. Rabbi Wiener is the senior rabbi and director of the Cedar sinai Spiritual Care Department. I, it, I, it's been like a good 15, 20 years since living in LA, but I think Cedar sinai is the largest hospital or definitely one of the big ones. Um, and Rabbi Wiener has really earned a, a place of distinction as a uh, uh, rabbi and caretaker, spiritual uh, mentor. Uh, rabbi Wiener, welcome. Thank you, thank you, very kind. Um, so I can't imagine, this show's mostly lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep it that way, but I, I really can't but imagine the notes that I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and I'm sure everyone's seeing the same uh, op-eds and memes and whatever it is from people who work in uh, frontline healthcare and ER. And I can't imagine what it's like to be on the spiritual side of that. I'm just gonna ask you, um, you know, for those of us who don't know, what, what is the work of a hospital chaplain? Is that, does that just mean you're, you're someone's personal rabbi when their personal rabbi is not able to be there? Does that mean you're the personal advocate? What, is it, what does it look like and have, have you built out your your department? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, a lot of people don't understand what chaplains are. And I still get people asking me all the time, you know, when I introduce myself as chaplain, Jews will say things like, you know, oh, don't try it on us, buddy. You know, we're Jewish. You're not going to convert us. So, um, <laughs> so you're, a lot of Jews don't understand what a chaplain does. That's true. It's basically, you know, I would not say that we're ever trying to replace a person's community rabbi. Um, if they have one, we're certainly working in conjunction with them. But a chaplain is the person who recognizes that, um, you know, healing, health in general, is about wholeness and wellness. And just like we say, Mishaberach, you know, Judaism has understood this for thousands of years. You know, when we say refuat hanefesh, refuat haguf. And unfortunately, in the modern world, the focus has only been in some places on, you know, refuat haguf. But there's a much broader uh, aspect of what it means to be human and part of being whole is being spiritually spiritually whole so a chaplain's job is to try to pe help people find a sense of spiritual well-being and spiritual comfort um, whether that's specifically in ritual and text and traditional expressions of religion or in broader kind of prayer uh, presence you know reflective practice that's more spiritual in nature so we're, I mean, like I said, we're hearing these stories about uh, about frontline healthcare and ERs being run down and ICUs. Um, mm -hmm. How has your job changed since the onset of the virus? Yeah, um, it's. I mean, it's stressful. It's challenging. It's scary. Um, there's just a lot of unknown and a lot of fear, and um, it's changed in that you know the focus also has gone from being primarily on patients, which it still is, but it's brought into um, caring for the caregivers, for staff who are feeling overwhelmed and afraid. And on the one hand, feeling like they have a sense of mission and they have to work hard and do everything they can for their patients, which it means a lot more right now than it normally does. At the same time, feeling that they have to care for their families who are worried and concerned about them. And it also means right now, um, caring for families of patients who are going through severe distress by not being able to be by their loved one's side because hospitals have in, invoked policies where they are preventing, in, in most cases, outsiders from being in the hospital because of fear of, um, of you know, transmitting disease and virus. And so they have to be especially careful. And so um, at this time, when you have patients being brought to the hospital, not just for coronavirus, for all sorts of things, you have families who are stuck on the outside and need support and guidance and, um, and, and are, are anxious and looking for our guidance as well. So um, 
it's brought in. It's also just this, the hecticness. And I think everyone's experiencing where there's like no set schedule and things are happening at all hours and people are worried and we're trying to do everything we can, but we don't have, you know, um, it's not like something that you do every day. So it's like, you know, we're trying to do our best, but there's this sense of, um, you know, everything's in haywire and we just have to figure out on the run what we're doing. So what, what does that mean on a, on a day-to-day basis? Are you, are you finding uh, care workers uh, or you know, nurses or, or PA that you just see like they're frazzled and you're like, hey, let, let's talk or what does it mean to care for, what does it mean to care for the caretakers? Yeah, so it means a few things. One thing it means simply is being present and being available. Um, we try to spend time you know, on the floors, out and about in the hospital and people, you know, there's a sense of camaraderie. The hospital's much quieter now, but um, th- those who are there feel like, you know, an appreciation that there's others there trying to help them. And um, so that's part of what it means, just being out and being available for them. It also means proactively um, showing them that we care. So whether that's creating signs that we put in the break rooms and care packages that just kind of expressing that, you know, we care about you and we appreciate you. Um, it means a lot to them and it really goes a long way. Um, I'm curious, do you, um, is there a crossover religiously? Meaning uh, you have a, a robust apartment. Um, do you end up servicing Catholics? Uh, do Catholics end up servicing Jews? Do Catholics ever ask you to do rituals, uh, specific Labdaf Catholics, Muslims, whatever it is? Yeah. What happens when that happens? Well, um, so our department, I mean, Cedar sinai is a Jewish hospital. And even though we have chaplains of all different religions, um, we believe that part of what it means to be a Jewish hospital is to be concerned for patients who otherwise would feel alienated meaning Jews who oftentimes feel when they're, let's say in a Catholic hospital to use that example, you know, having a cross on the wall and a priest come to visit them, it feels, you know, it feels strange to many Jews. So we, we want to be sensitive to that. And therefore at our hospital, we try to make sure that a Jewish patient gets a Jewish chaplain, a Catholic patient gets a Catholic chaplain and et cetera. So we're trying to provide um, care that is um, co-religionist as we call it. Although of course there are times, whether it's the emergencies or someone's not available or things come up where support is needed across religions. And basically our approach to that is to say that, you know, um, what I like to say is, you know, every human being is in some ways like everyone else in the world, in some ways like no one else in the world, and in some ways like some other people. And so what we try to recognize is that, yeah, for a practicing Catholic or practicing Muslim, whatever you want to um, use as an example, there are certain things that I do not have in common with them and certain things that we practice differently. But there are certain things that we have in common. For example, um, most human beings, I mean, almost everyone, there, uh, there's a common sense of loneliness or fear or anxiety and the power of having someone who's compassionate and cares and non-judgmental to sit and listen and be with you. So that can go beyond religion. And sometimes there's even slight, slightly sort of religious things that can cross religious boundaries. Like let's say a Christian patient, um, even though I'm not gonna perform any sort of Christian rituals with them, but perhaps we can connect over Psalms or something like that, if that's meaningful to them. There are things that we share in common that we can not, um, we can maintain our own authenticity, but still share some sort of somewhat religious um, expressions together. just thinking before about taking care of the caretakers and you're the caretaker taking care of the caretakers so who's taking care of the caretakers and uh to rephrase the question has has this crisis struck you personally i pardon if it's overly personal question but has has this affected you has this affected you spiritually um do you feel that that tension inside yourself or inside the other co-chaplains yeah, of course. I mean, I think everyone's feeling, I think everyone's feeling uh, anxious right now and a little bit depressed and nervous and worried. Um, you no know, one knows what the future is going to bring. And us people have already seen so much sadness and destruction and, and pain. So of course I'm feeling that as well. And some days really intensely. Um, and, and it's crucial. Every person in a caring profession, in a service profession has to have some kind of a self-care plan. So uh, for me, you know, when I got into chaplaincy, I got really into exercise. I unfortunately had gone a number of years of sort of neglecting myself physically. And then I got back. I've unfortunately had that same experience. (laughs) I'm uh, I'm undergoing this experience as we speak. (laughs) Yeah. So it's never too late. Um, So like lately, I've been really trying to run a lot and, you know, do things to care for myself, um, forcing myself to try to get enough sleep, even when it's hard. 
you know, to go to sleep at night, but so, sort of saying like, sort of sometimes just leaving the hospital and saying, you know what, today I need to make it a half day or, um, you know, doing things to um, proactively care for ourselves is absolutely crucial right now. And it's a great question. I appreciate that you asked it because people need to be thinking about that, especially as this drags on and on, you cannot maintain this um, without stopping to care for oneself and do things to um, promote one's own well-being. Definitely. Uh, Rabbi Wiener, just uh, you have a, a final message, or do you want to let people know how they can find you online? I know uh, you're a recent Machaber Sefer. Thank you. Well, I have a website, rabbiweiner.com, W E I N E R, rabbiweiner.com, and people are welcome. I try to post stuff about um, medical ethics related and things that I'm interested in, and people are welcome to be in touch that way and to know that, um, you know, this is a difficult crisis, but I have been so impressed. And so heartwarmed by the way the Jewish community has come together, provided resources, reached out to each other proactively. People haven't just bunkered down and kind of hidden themselves. Rather, they've thought and sought out ways to help others. And I've been so impressed by that. And we should really be proud of our community and the way we really care about each other. And in that merit, may God um, protect all of us and put an end to this and protect the whole world. And may we see brighter days very, very soon. I mean, I want to thank you for joining and hopefully this is a restful Shabbos for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Same to you. Good to talk to you. Take care. Bye. This is OU Live. I'm your host, Rabbi David Pardo. We have an awesome lineup. We've had a great week. We've had some really great guests and we've had a lot of great suggestions from you. Thank you for being in touch. Please continue to do so. Uh, we're taking off after today, you know. Or, uh, for Shabbos Kodesh, but after that, we're back on OU Live at OU.org. Share your suggestions. Stay tuned. In about 10 or so minutes, we're going to jam out with Avram Rosenblum of the Diaspora Yeshiva Band. In the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Rabbi Mark Wilds. Rabbi Wilds is the founder and director of the Manhattan Jewish Experience some 18 years ago, maybe 19 years ago. He'll tell us. Rabbi Wilds. Okay, uh, 21. 21? <laughs> I, yeah, my math is bad. 21, it's pretty good. 18 is close. I mean, 18 is like adulthood. 21 is, you know, I don't know what that number means. Uh, I'm just impressed you got Avram Rosenblum. He was one of my idols uh, musically uh, growing up. And I have these chus of actually playing with him. I played drums, percussion. He's awesome. Yo, stick around. You're, yeah, no one's gonna kick you out. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> Twenty-one years ago, you were like the first one thinking that there needs to be something for this age group that wasn't the shul. Yeah, I mean, um, we. It was an experiment when I began MJE. Uh, the idea was to see if we could pull out of the woodwork twenties uh, and thirties unaffiliated uh, who were not currently engaged in Judaism. Uh, actively engaged in their Judaism and didn't have much of a background. And uh, it turned into a whole big uh, organizational mess called MGE. <laughs> a, a big, beautiful, lovely mess. Yeah. So, you know, we had, uh, the days are bleeding into each other. It was either yesterday or two days ago, meaning last year in Corona years, we had uh, Rabbi Robinson uh -huh. on talking about how, uh, how shuls have uh, changed and adjusted and uh, responded, virtualized, I suppose, to um, this, you know, new status quo. I'm curious how 20s and 30s, I can't say millennials anymore, because now we're, we're grouping in Gen Z. So <laughs> how do, how do you know, folks who are living in the city, and, and a, a lot of them alone, how are they, how are you servicing them? And how are they planning on spending Pesach? And how are they dating? And what's uh, their life looks like? And just, yeah, it's, it's a really weird, you know, on one hand, our population, 20s and 30s, may be a little less anxious about the disease itself, but a little more anxious about the isolation and aloneness because they're sort of nishtahin, nishtaher in their lives. They're no longer with their families and haven't created their own family yet. So they're very much alone. A lot of them cooped up in these like tiny apartments. It's probably one of the reasons that our heavy dose of online programming, we shifted very quickly on Purim, to online, not just with Megillat Esther, but with everything since. And literally every night of the week, there are classes. I'm doing a lunch and learn myself every day for an hour. And I'm getting an average of a thousand viewers just for the lunch and learn. Those aren't the special ones. Uh, my, my son who plays guitar, <coughs> uh, Yosef, has been accompanying me 
for Kabbalah Shabbos, uh, 6.15 tomorrow. Uh, you can just go on MJE, Manhattan Jewish Experience. I'm sure the OU has a ton of this. Havdalah, Saturday night. Uh, I, we had, I did a halal with uh, Etan Katz this morning, so it's actually oh. been like wonderful for my that dominating. <laughs> <laughs> I was on that too. He's 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 incredible. Um, he was incredible. Um, so it's being extremely well received. It was a very quick pivot for us because we do so much already on social media, and our population is so comfortable with it. I would say primarily Facebook and Instagram; those seem to be the big uh, mediums for our population. But it's like um, people are feeling very, very alone and isolated. They're a little freaked out about Pesach, and we're a bit of in a quandary. I've spoken with a number of post gim just about how to uh, just creatively try to connect people because we can't do what we're so good at and what every care of organization needs to do, which is to set people up for meals. My wife is around the clock, always setting people up every Shabbos. I'm in my dining room here. There's always 20 people here. Um, for lunch at my own home and the other five rabbis, and we can't do that. And it, it, it broke my heart. I spoke to one of my students today, Daniel. He's originally from California. He's in New Jersey now. And his family, he's an amazing, amazing guy, but his family's not really connected. He didn't grow up with much. And as of now, he's doing the Seder alone because I can't fix him up with, with a family. Uh, and I don't want to take that responsibility that maybe he's carrying, even if, even if he isn't symptomatic, that he's going to bring it someplace. The families are nervous about hosting. I haven't seen my own father, uh, who's 87, Bliain Hara. He lives across the park. I haven't seen him in, in almost three weeks. And, um, you know, everyone's a little freaked out. So I, I, on, the, on the good note, on the positive note, MG has actually taken a step forward. Um, We've gotten so much social media attention. I've been on CBS twice and Metro Focus once on, on, on PBS. I'm getting calls because I did my first virtual bris. Thank God I wasn't the Mohel. I don't know if that would have been possible. <laughs> um, I did. I mean, I'm doing. Yeah, but I'm bummed. I did. I'm doing all this like stuff and and um, and people are loving it and they're so appreciative. I'm getting outpourings. I'm getting texts and emails all day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's what's next? You know, I had one student, um, well, we went to Israel this past summer. We go every summer. So I just, my wife WhatsApp the group. It's like 25 participants. You guys want to do a little Zoom call? So one woman, you know, everyone was like, yeah, everybody. And then we said, well, when's good? And one woman responded, um, I'm available all day, all week. <laughs> um, anytime you pick, I'll be here. People are so available now. It just It's like a golden era of uh, being able to connect with people. In an era where we can't connect with people. Yeah. Time for opposites. Yeah. What's your, you know, yesterday, uh, um, Rabbi Weil, with whom you're not to be confused, uh, had some tips for, for running a Seder with your family, meaning like half of the people running Sarm this year are running Sarm for the first time. You're probably preparing people to lead Sarm by themselves. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. I'm curious, A, if, if, that's right, and what, what those conversations are like, and B, what your tips are. So um, for us, we are training people to run their, not only a Seder alone, but their very first ever Seder. Because every year, we spend most of our time trying to send our people to other people's Sedarim, and we give them nice little Vortlach to share. Look what I learned at MJE. They don't really do their own, okay? Um, now we're training them to actually run their own Seder, and uh, unfortunately, as I just shared before, we're not really setting them up with other people. Some, some, some people might just be with one parent. Some people might be alone. What we're trying to do is replace the family, if you will, this is difficult, replace the energy of the group with, I'm doing this, I can do this. We have, I'm doing a mock Seder next week, Rabbi Pinney. Rosenthal, who I'm sure you know, is doing a mock Seder for us. Rabbi Avi Heller is there. We're just doing a lot of mock Seders and how-tos to train people to sort of replace the chevra or the family with, never done this before, I'm going to try this on my own this year. Um, and everything from kashering your kitchen to selling chametz to running your own Seder, it's quite challenging. I've been, I was on the phone just last night with Rav Schechter. From 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 all you, Rav Herschel Shechter Shlita, and uh, it was very very helpful to me. I've been talking to other post game and mentors and teachers of mine how to really just pump them up and make them feel good about Passover. 
even though they're nervous about being alone. Do you have a, you have like a, a, a tip or it could be a vort or it could be a something to leave us with. Um, I know you, I, I'd l- please later remind me if I don't ask you to plug that, uh, that webinar, but obviously you have a lot of material prepared, but I'm just curious, something that you can, uh, Leave with our listeners. I'll Let's tell you one quick Reza. thing. Um, I heard this actually uh, from one of the Russian shivas at YU. I have two boys in YU and they're home. So I'm like peeking over their shoulder and listening on their Torah. One of the Rebbeim said something interesting about Corona. The word Seder means order. Because in order for us to feel ki'iluhu yatsam in Mitzrayim, as though you yourself were redeemed from Egypt, you have to structure things. It can't be loosey-goosey. And that is a very important message for people now. We wake up. Who cares what time we wake up? Who cares what time we dive in? Who cares what time we... No, you have to create an order. You got to get dressed. I mean, I'm sitting here. I put the jacket on. I just keep it right here and I keep putting it on before I teach. It's a really important thing for people to create structure and Seder in their lives. I know that's not maybe a piece of Torah for the Seder itself, but it's a piece of Torah about the Seder that could be used for our lives right now. Don't let your day just sort of morph along, hanging out in your sweats all day. That is a not a good recipe for a healthy kind of structured day that needs beginnings and ends and times to pray and time to relax and 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 and, and call other people the other thing i will mention i just saw a beautiful piece of torah from the rav uh rav salvechik zechatzad levracha who wrote so magnificently about how many times um yitziat mitzrayim again and again and again is mentioned throughout our liturgy it's in the third paragraph of the Shema. It's in Berkat uh, it, it, It's all over. And then we have Pesach on top of it. And one of the things he mentions, which is very, very powerful, we don't always think about this, but our sensitivity to the oppressed, to the victim, to individuals who are somehow helpless in their situations. You know, where does the bleeding Jewish heart liberal come from? Why is it that in the forefront of every civil rights and human rights movement, there's always Jews? without fail. And the Rav wrote that it is embedded within the Jewish consciousness to feel compassion and to feel sympathy for someone that is down and out. And it's all over the Torah. Vahafta Sager, love the stranger, 36 times, not to take the almana's security or the collateral overnight. I mean, like a million and one, because we began as slaves. We began as an oppressed, victimized people. And that's why we keep going back to Yitzhak Mitzrayim. One of the reasons, there are many reasons why it's so fundamental in our theology. But one of the ideas is because chesed, olam chesed yibaneh, and sensitivity, compassion, and kindness, it's another very important message, I think, during this corona time. No matter how off, bad off you think you are, don't let the day go by without picking up the phone and calling someone who is older, your parents, your grandparents, if you're blessed to have them, and, 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 and attend to someone that is more down and out. And that could be very helpful to us. And it's really expressive of one of the great themes of Pesach. Can I, I just want to break a rule because you, you shared this piece from the Rav and I, I've heard a similar piece from the Rav and maybe you, you heard it also, but I just want to share it anyway. About, yeah. uh, I, it's that book that, you know, he came out with these books posthumously, the, the one on page of yeah. Redemption, Redemption. He talks about, um, the, the meaning of yachat, it's a strength, like why we have to break it. And the reason you have to break it, the Rav had this theory that he uh, shares in the end of halachic mind that we could extrapolate all of hashkafa from halacha in a scientific orderly way. Uh, if only we understood all the halacha, then we would, uh, we would be able to, you know, not putz around, we would know for sure what the correct hashkafa is. So he said there, one of the halachas of being a slave, in order to understand hashkafa freedom, you need to understand the halachas of slavery. The, the one of the halachas of slaves is you can't marry. Why can't you marry? That's a halacha. What's that shkafa of not being able to marry? The reason you can't marry is because marriage requires you to be able to abandon your identity. I'm no longer a me. I'm part of a we. There's a new entity. There's me, you, and then there's we. That's new. And you're part of these concentric circles. That's part of being part of being Beautiful. a free person is being able to let go of the of the I'm just I and now I'm part of a larger thing and then you have a family and you have kids and you have grandkids and you have concentric circles of community and ha- and where's the moment where we saw that that the Jews who were slaves for hundreds of years became free it was in the moment when they left Mitzrayim and some had matzah and some didn't and the ones who had matzah broke theirs in half oh, and shared 
with the ones who didn't. That was beautiful. It's, I thought it, it, same idea, different Lavush. Thank God. That my wild. And by yeah. the way, I mentioned another thing, and you can share this, and your listeners can share this at the Seder. The Rav said that when he was a little boy, his grandfather, the famed Rav Chaim Salavitcha, came to his Seder as a, with a pot on his head. And the reason he came with a pot on his head was to get the quit the kids to question. And like, what is going on? He giggled as a kid, you know, his serious grandfather, Rav Chaim, has got a pot on his head. The, the other thing is, is to shake it up. Don't be bound, if you will, by the Haggadah. The Haggadah should really be a springboard into a broader conversation and do whatever is necessary to get everyone at the table involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rabbi Wild, those of us who are very fired up about the idea of coming to your webinar or just want to learn more from you and with you, how do they find you online? Uh, go. My Facebook page is like crazy right now. So Rabbi Mark Wilds, uh, the picture you had of me before dressed like I was a uh, yeah, we, I was actually we can't, we can't pull it up, unfortunately. Yeah, so that was know. my Mark Wilds page. Go to Rabbi Mark Wilds, my public page, or Manhattan Jewish Experience, um, and you'll be able to hear it every every day, twelve thirty. Kabbalah Shabbos tomorrow, six fifteen. Havdalah Saturday night. You'll get all this stuff. I would I would I would recommend the Facebook. Rabbi Wilds, it's been a pleasure. I hope this Shabbos brings you and your your kihila of many thousands uh, a lot of rest and restoration. I mean, you should be matzliach as well. And thank you for doing this. Kolaka vote. Take good care. You are on OU Live. My name is Rabbi David Pardo. It's been uh, an exciting week. I'm genuinely looking forward to Shabbos. Even though it's been hard and different, but uh, it's good to reconnect. And we, I don't want to lose Kesher with you. So be in touch. Be in touch in the comments. Be in touch at OU Live at OU.org. Let us know how things are going. Sounds like we're ready for our next guest. Avram Rosenblum, can you flip your video on? I hope you weren't expecting John Lennon. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Avram, thank you so much for joining. Oh, are you kidding? It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Hang on, let me, uh, what do I have to do? I have to start. Is my video working? Yeah. 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 Ah, okay. Good. Let me get rid of this little box. Now the box is out of my way. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I want to play a song. Hashem, the face Hashem. Let's get everybody going, right? Hey, and tomorrow is fucking air is my the face Hashem, the face Hashem. But the new moon, the saver, the shining the the hockey, the shar Hashem. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and all the ships at sea. How are you? <laughs> We're great, all of us at sea. How are you? Okay, I'm, I'm uh, very happy. I appreciate uh, you inviting me here tonight. And uh, what do I have? am I too bright in the face? I look, I, I look, oh, there, I have to back off a little bit. I look like a ghost, the ghost of Avram Rosenblum. Anyway, you want to talk about Jewish rock? What do you want to talk about? Um, you're, you're, you're like one of the founders, right? Like when you started in the, in the 80s, uh, 
Jewish rock wasn't a thing. The seventies. Yeah, seventies. The band, uh, the Diaspora Shiva band, actually kicked off in nineteen seventy-five at uh, at a Hanukkah concert we did at Beit Am, which is uh, anybody knows Beit Am. That was also where they tried Eichmann um, originally. So it's a very famous place, but it's a beautiful auditorium. And uh, we put our first album out in seventy-six, and. Uh, that has a quick little story to it. Um, our our uh, launch date, our release date was uh, July 4th of 1976. You know your history at all. That was, that was the day of Antebi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, so we were waiting you know, to do a big My show. And, uh, and in the end, the whole country was dancing you know, with, uh, with joy because uh, you know, the Antebi rescue took place. And uh, so that was, that was our, our launch date for our first album. So that's a day we'll never forget. And... Uh, I don't know. So let's see. Um, Jewish rock, right? We want to. I'm like this guy that represents, you know, Jewish rock, right? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you're you're the Godfather. I mean, th there wasn't there wasn't a thing called Jewish rock when you started, right? The truth there was, is there, there the was like some is, folk music, country music. There was no, the stuff. Is, there was Jewish rock. I'll tell you why. Because um, at about the same time that we were kicking off um, in Brooklyn and Crown Heights. So my dear, uh, my dear friend, uh, Yossi Piamenta, Zechron Levrocha, had a band called Piamenta with his brother Avi. And they were, they were rocking about the same time. I, the advantage that, uh, the thing that got us famous was that uh, we were in the Israeli uh, Hasidic Song Festival in 77 and 78. 77 was Hu Yiftach Libenu, which, Hu Yiftach Libenu, if you, you forgot it. Um, and then uh, the following year was Malchus Chal. Malchus Chal, Malchus Chal Olamim. How's that for a lead-in? Bechol Dor Bechol, Malchus Chal, Malchus Chal Olamim. Omim Shaltecha, Bechol Dor Bechol, Malchus Chal. Everybody, come on. This is the Reader's Digest version. So that was 1978. And then two years later, we came back. They didn't want us uh, for, for 1980. I mean, excuse me, for 79, because we won first place twice in a row. So they said, no, you can't come back this time. Right? You, you guys have too much of, a, of an advantage now. So, so the, but they let us back in in 1980. And uh, we, did the, we did this one. A pistol, pistol, lee. Share, said, deca, vo, vo, vam. O, deca. Pistol, pistol, lee. Share, said, deca, vo, vo, vam. O, deca. Pistol, lee. Share, said, deca, vo, vam. Okay, <laughs> and then and then, uh, but we and we stuck around for a while. the uh, The band was popular pretty much from uh, nineteen seventy seven, you know, seventy six, seventy seven, and um, our our first incarnation ended in eighty three. In 83, then we, uh, we changed our name for a while because um, too many people were having problems with di diaspora. What does that mean exactly over there, di diaspora? So we, we changed our name to Sela. We were actually, we were playing at the NCSY Center on Strauss Street. So uh, you must have been a youngin back then, but- uh, I, I won't confirm or deny. <laughs> so we played there for, for a couple of years under the name Sela, Samach Lamed Hay, which is an acronym for Sav, Lamala Hashar, which means take it from the top. So uh, we, were, we were taking it from the top, starting under a new name uh, with most of the guys in the band. And uh, we played Is that there. what David Melech meant also in Tehillim when he stuck Sela at the end of the thing? It was a, it was a signal to the Levium to take it from the top. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. So, uh, so we played there off and on for a couple of years. And we would alternate with, uh, with another truly talented uh, duo, the Magama duo, which was uh, Moshe S and the uh, Shalom Levine. Both of them are, uh, you know, smiling down on us from the next world. Unfortunately, uh, we lost them too early, but uh, they were also an amazing talent. So there was a lot of stuff going on uh, at the same time that we were kicking off. But like I said, so the, the couple of songs we had in the Israel Hasidic Festival really, uh, you know, were good for us and helped us, um, helped us book 
you know, shows in the, back in the States and Canada. So we started touring uh, in 1979, late 78, 79. And, uh, you know, we just kept building from there. Motsi Shabbos, if anybody out there remembers, uh, on Hart Sion was King David's Malava Malka. And um, we would get hundreds and hundreds of tourists and students, uh, all kinds of youth groups. We'd get your NCSY groups. We'd also get USY. We'd get Nifty. We'd get Wifty. We'd get, I mean, we had, we had them all. They were all coming up. Beautiful thing was everybody was dancing together. It was so wonderful. There was so much achtos. There was so much joy in that everybody was feeling just, you know, being together and dancing and singing in Yerushalayim and by Keber David. So it was a really, really unique experience. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say I, I have a complaint, but I, but I kind of wish Mashiach had come then because it was a high point. It was great. It was just a great time for him to come. So uh, it's not anyway. too late. Uh, no, no, he'll come now too. That's okay. We'll, we'll let him. <laughs> we don't mind. And then you restarted the band with your son. In so that 98. A, that's right. A, a number of years later. So uh, after the band had disbanded uh, for a number of years. So then uh, we were here. I was here in the States with my family. And uh, my son Mo and I uh, started a new version called Avram Rosenblum and Diaspora, which was a few of the, few of the originals uh, and, a, and a few new guys. And uh, we did an album called Jerusalem is Calling. And uh, that did nicely. But the touring didn't happen so much, so uh, we disbanded about a year later. But uh, it was a good band recording-wise. We did we did a, you know some nice stuff, and then uh, we started with uh, reunions that uh, started happening in uh, ninety. When was it already? It was like 92, 93. My good friend David Golding, known as Ding, um, brought us in for a Carnegie Hall concert for the Sharashim organization, which was you know for Soviet Jewry. So we did that one as a wonderful reunion that was recorded that's out there. A few years later, we came back and did, did another one also at, uh, at Avery Fisher Hall this time for um, another, um, another Russian yeshiva high school. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, they would, you know, take us out of the closet, dust us off, you know, <laughs> you know air us out for a while so you couldn't smell the mothballs, you know, and, uh, you know, and we would rock, uh, rock again. And uh, we always had good chemistry. The band was... No matter no matter when we got together, we could always we could always make it happen uh, within a within a day's worth of rehearsing. We sounded just like ourselves. Who was the most famous band or musician you had to uh, rock out with? The most famous band I ever rocked out with? You were or the diaspora all together? Uh, I think you know. I think each one of us, you know, experienced uh, the music world at different times with with different people. I mean, my. Um, my uh, vocal partner, Ben Sion Solomon, had uh, used to hang out with Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead out in San Francisco. And, and uh, I, got, I got to hang out uh, with, um, with uh, Danny DeVito and Judd Hirsch and uh, you know, all the people from like the taxi days uh, in a theater group that I was part of uh, back, in the, back in the late 60s and like 68, 69. Um, I also, let's see, who was there? Oh, uh, Morgan Freeman was also part of that group. So, you know, I got to hang out with some pretty crazy people. Where, where was that? In Philly. I, I, I never mentioned, I grew up in Philly. Well, I didn't really grow up, but I, I'm from Philly. <laughs> you know, and um, so there was a, a place called the Theater of Living Arts, famous place, eventually became a big rock and roll uh, center. But anyway, so that was that. And then, uh, and then years later, um, I was at the Kotel one night. This, this, is, this is one of, one of, one of my two good Kotel stories. And um, you know, there were always American groups coming in and the different artists from different parts of the world into Yerushalayim. I saw B.B. King in Yerushalayim. I saw Eric Clapton in Yerushalayim. And it was like the best place you could possibly see them. And uh, one night I'm down at the hotel about midnight. And there are a few people that start, you know, coming down towards the wall. I saw it was a bit of an entourage. And I see they're all accompanying this one, you know, short guy with frizzy hair. And I'm saying to myself, that guy looks familiar. And next thing I know, he's standing next to me at the hotel, you know, about an arm's length. You know, we, 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 we could stand closer than six feet in those days. So uh, anyway, so uh, I'm I, old I enough said, to remember. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so I said, wow, Joe Cocker. Right. You know, Joe Cocker, Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Uh, you are so beautiful to me. I mean, Joe Cocker. You know, so I said, Joe, where you been? He looks at me, says, well, I got to tell you a story. Yeah, my, my managers ripped me off. 
I was down and out for a couple of years, you know, and, and I, I'm just starting to rebuild my career. I said, dude, you've come to the right place. See this wall over here? It's not really a wall. It's the world's largest microphone. And all you need to do is talk to it very quietly. And God is listening to every word you have to say. Well, I don't know if it's because of me, but his career took off like amazingly, like right after that. So I don't know. I, maybe I helped a little bit. So <laughs> it's it my right joke. time, my place. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, and then, well, I'll tell you the next one anyway. So in 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 um, in eighty seven, so um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were on tour with Bob Dylan, and uh, so there was a uh, there was a, a moment uh, or a couple of a couple of days where I was uh, I'd been working for Mayor Schuster, Zechariah Levracha in the old city. I was running his Heritage House for a while. And um, I went down to the wall and there's Tom Petty and some of the other guys in his band, his whole entourage. And uh, we had been invited to perform on an MTV special that was that was about his tour, which we recorded like the day before. But I didn't expect them to show up in the old city. And I, as soon as I heard they were there, I went down to the wall and I had this whole session talking to Tom Petty and another uh, major star named Roger McGuinn from a group called The Birds. Hey, Mr. Tambourine, you know, that, that, that's, was, that was their first big hit. Anyway. Just careful, was, we're worried about copyright issues. Kind of. Yeah, it was a Bob Dylan song, anyway. But uh, yeah, Bob may knock on my door for royalties. Let's see what happens. But anyway, um, so the, they were there with a bunch of other guys from their band. And I got into this whole Kabbalistic schmooze with Tom Petty telling him, you know, actually in Breslov terms about how, you know, up there on, on that mountaintop is a rock. And that rock is considered the foundation stone of the entire universe, right? And so from there, they actually named the that um, that whole show Rock Israel, because you know, because rock and rock and all that stuff. Anyway, so what was really beautiful was I, I explained it to him, and he was very interested, or he seemed to be very interested. And then a, a minute later, when he's walking away from from the hotel, and they've got him on tape, and he's saying. You know, I had 10, 10 years of Sunday school and, and I got more from five minutes of talking to that guy than I ever got from any of that. <laughs> so that, 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 made it, that made it to MTV, which was kind of cool. Anyway, so- uh, Wait, oh, hold on, how did I get to MTV? You had a camera crew with them? Yeah, 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 they had a whole, a whole, yeah, a whole thing going on. It's on, so it's on, it's on YouTube, but uh, just go Rosenblum, Petty, McGuinn, just the, or Rosenblum, Petty, you'll, you'll, you'll see us there. For a couple of minutes at the hotel, they, they captured the whole thing. It was really kind of cool. Wow, that's right. Yeah, it was like you know, but uh, so uh, so if you want my opinion about today's Jewish music, um, I was I was gonna ask. I was afraid to ask. I'm not sure. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Here's the bottom line. Okay, you know we are. I, I guess diaspora yeshiva band and my career, you know, are, are essentially, you know, boxed as classic Jewish rock, you know, like the, uh, the, 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 the forerunners of a whole lot of different bands and a whole lot of different, you know, contemporary groups uh, and, and performers that, uh, that took it from there, you know, and, and took it into, into their, you know, into their era, into their group. I mean, there's some, there's some great people out there. There were some great bands after us. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, there was Pimenta, there was Magama, uh, there was a, uh, Later on, when they got a little bit older, you had the Moshav band, which are Moshav band, Soul yeah, Farm. That's been uh, Yehuda Solomon's Ben Seal, my old partner's son, um, and a few other Solomon groups. So one of them is Soul Farm with, uh, with Noah Chase Solomon, and 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 she, and uh, C Landsbaum. I mean, there was a whole you know wave uh -huh. that came out of came out of that whole that whole time. And, do, you, do you appreciate the designation of being the the, the godfather, the the progenitor of this? I, I'm you, not wearing a ring, and you don't have to kiss it. But uh, yes, I like it. <laughs> Where but, I come from, you get a cool hat, also. Yeah, yeah, I'm not wearing the hat today, but uh, I'm sitting like in my turban. Yeah, I mean, it would be really pretentious here in my studio with his hat on, you know, looking like you know movie star, all that stuff. But uh, I don't need the hat in here. It's hot in here anyway. Um, so how's by you? How's uh, what's going on in New York? I, I assume that's where you are. You were, or God forbid, I'm in New Jersey. You're in New Jersey. It's a different uh, thing. Where in Jersey? Me, I'm in coming to you live from Fairlawn. Oh, okay. North down the, Jersey, yeah. Down the road from Teaneck. I we don't like to think of ourselves as uh, down the road from Teaneck, but yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the we way. Were, uh, yeah, I want to wish a, a Rafu Shlema, by the way, my, my brother-in-law, uh, Joey Bodner, who lives in Teaneck, 
everybody knows Joey. So uh, Joey is an, a bit under the weather right now and they're just checking him out to make sure that everything's okay. Uh, so uh, for Shlema Joey, Yosef, uh, Yosef Shimon Ben Yehudis and uh, you know, I, we're all, I mean- We're all davening. Listen, we're, we're hearing so much and we're starting to hear names of people that we can recognize and we're starting to hear this one's, you know, relative and that one's relative. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a little scary. I, I, I'll share this with you. This is a thought that goes on in my head a lot because uh, I, you know, I was born in, in 1950. Okay. I'm an, I'm an you know, ultra rocker, if you will. So, uh, you know, my, my generation as children of Holocaust survivors, my parents came from Vilna. They, uh, they went through uh, all that. My dad was a teenage partisan with his brother. My mom and my aunt survived with their parents somehow or other because uh, a kind non-Jewish family um, hid them in the basement of their home in the, in the Vilna ghetto area. Um, and so, you know, we, growing up with all that and all this, you know, and, and stories, and if it wasn't stories, it was still the emotions of the post-Holocaust era, you know, that you got from your parents and you didn't know what was hitting you most of the time. Um, and so now, you know, here we are all these, all these years later, and the world seems to be turning on its head once again. It's very, it's very interesting. And it's, and it's very strange. It's like, talk about being a sandwich generation. It's like, this one's hard to chew. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to chew, you know, because our, our history is still with us. You know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the experiences of our parents and grandparents are, are inside us. You know, we, we still feel them very you know, very, very acutely um, because of the way we were, we were raised. And, uh, you know, and now, you know, now we're facing a world that's getting a bit hostile again. And now we've got this virus on top of all of it. So the question is, you know, what does Hashem want from us? I, you've, I know you've had enough rabbis on your show already that are trying to explain that one. And I'm sure you've been trying to explain it also. And I'm sure you have a better explanation than I do. But um, I think that the one thing, the one takeaway for real is that you get to you get to think you get to sit and think about your life you get to sit and think about how you can tweak things and make them a little bit better you know whether it's a do or a don't do do it now so to speak you know now is now is the time to you know to to become uh woke i don't know is that a word <laughs> it is it's definitely it's a word uh yeah but i'm not sure that it's yeah but now's the time to pick up the uh the the guitar that you always wanted to pick up or the book you never finished or totally. the totally uh the daf yomi habit you always wished you had uh invested more time in yeah look you know it's uh it's it's that it's it's that time it's that time whether it's whether we, we, we want to say something scary like it's uh a yom hadin or whatever it is but whatever it is it's, it's pretty heavy what's coming down from Shemayim right now. And the Abishter wants something from us. Klai Yisrael is, uh, you know, we're, all, we're always on the spot and the spotlight's always on us and uh, we have to perform. We have to do what we're best known uh, to do, which is, uh, you know, serve Hashem. So, uh, I see you're getting ready to perform. If the was a shambis simha, if the was a shambis simha, bowl of fun of beer, and a laugh on the beer, and a laugh on the beer, and a laugh on the beer, and a Everybody, if do S Hashem Besimcha, if do S Hashem Besimcha, if do S Hashem Besimcha, all the fun of Bernana, all the fun of Bernana, if do S Hashem Besimcha, Besimcha. How am I doing? Like, you know, I'm staring at a tiny little green light at the top of my uh, iMac, you know? And, it represents there's actually millions of people. That's, yeah, that's what that what green I, light means. That's what I'm thinking. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's like a yesh, yesh me'ayin. You know what I mean? It's like, it's that moment, you know, the, that pinhole, you know, in, in, in creation, you know, where then everything explodes and becomes the universe. So, hi, everybody in the universe. How are you? 
So uh, anywhere you want to ask me something good, like really good. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> your, the, your favorite show you ever played. My favorite show that we ever played. Uh, probably the, probably the most exciting show we ever played was when we were, we were in Cincinnati, Ohio. <clears throat> Uh, on the on the day that uh, the first peace treaty between Israel and uh, and and uh, not Egypt. I what year was this? I think it was the first the first peace treaty peace treaty in uh, it should have been. I like, believe like, it was Egypt. Like 1990, 89. No, we did a we did a peace treaty with with uh, Begin um, and Egypt before then in 75. Right, that okay. was the early one. This would so this is the one with with uh, with Jimmy, I think with Jimmy Carter, and no, this is the one with Clinton with uh, with uh, Arafat. Oh, Arafat, yeah, yeah, it, yeah and that, right. And everybody got excited. It really looked like it was going to be a peace treaty, but you know, he's a, he was a snake, so you know, we uh, we couldn't put any, you know. But it was exciting, and we, you know, we were celebrating peace, and what you know, what's greater than that? Look, in the at the end of the day, that's our, that's our that's our spiel that's our that's our you know schmooze to the world you know make it a peaceful place what's wrong with you <laughs> you know like like why you know why are we repeating the same things in history that, that that have been done time and time and time again you know and that's and that's that's my prayer every day to, to Kodesh Baruch I say look you know you've seen this before you've seen us go around the wheel again and again and again and aren't you <laughs> as neighbors to tired of it you know, so, uh, you know, we, we hope he is. We hope he is. Can you, uh, we're, we are low on time. Can you play us one song from that, from that show? Bring that, that, bring that memory of peace back. From that show. All right. <laughs> Thank you. How to do? <laughs> you were, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For, have a, have for a beautiful it. Shabbos. You too. Thanks. You know, good Shabbos to everybody. And uh, what can I tell you? It's uh, it's make it meaningful it, because it sure is. Let's. Uh, why, why don't we just play on the way out as we uh, as we end the show? All right. Here we go. This is a song I like to end my show with these days. Uh, it's called uh, Yivarechukah. Ready?
Shalom, all Yisrael. Thanks, man. And we are out.